today we have four distinguished speakers from UK, India, and Bangladesh. Honorable speakers are Professor Dr. Alongir Hoshain, Professor Dr. Shahadat Hoshain, Professor Dr. Muhammad Abdul Rajak, and Dr. Nilan Jonde. Today's session will be moderated by Professor Dr. Muhammad Shamsul Arifin, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Chuet, and me, Muhammad Ahsan Habib, Department of ICT, Maulana Hashani Science and Technology University. Now, I request uh, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Shahadat Hoshain uh, to, uh, I, I would like to at first introduce uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Shahadat Hoshain. He is our uh, second speaker, but uh, our first speaker was not connected now. So we would like to introduce him and here we start. Uh, professor Dr. Mohd Shahadat Hoshain is serving as the Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Chittagong, Bangladesh since 2007. He worked as the Chairman of the same department from 2005 to 2011. He both his MPhil and doctoral degree in computation from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UK, in 1999 and 2002 respectively. Professor Dr. Mohammad Shahadat Hussain is an internationally renowned scholar holding many prestigious scholarships and visiting professorships in Abroad. He awarded prestigious Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellowship in 2009 and Tendal Visiting Fellowship in 2006. In 2011 and 2013, Professor Hussain awarded prestigious European Commission sponsored Erasmus Mundus Academic Staff Fellowship at the University of Alvor, Denmark. He is also the holder of Parkoms Scholarship as a visiting professor from 2014 to till day. Dr. Hoshain successfully completed a number of research projects. Recently, he awarded prestigious Swedish Research Council grant as a foreign node leader. His current research interest includes the novel idea of sustainable computing, which combines pervasive computing with belief rule-based expert systems, health informatics, effective computing, deep learning, internet of things, big data, e-governance, and philosophy of computing. He is supervising masters and doctoral students at both home and abroad. Dr. Shahadat has published about 130 scholarly articles in the reputed international journals and conferences such as ITPOLI Infocom, LCN, CCNC, etc. Recently, one of his papers obtained Best Paper Award in the ITPOL Info Camp held in Atlanta, USA. He is the author of a number of books. His jointly authored book entitled Computing Reality is published by uh, Oshima Research Institute Blue Ocean Press in Tokyo, Japan. Now, I would like to start uh, his presentation regarding fight against COVID-19 pandemic using machine learning. Now, Professor Dr. Mohammad Shahadat Hussain. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction and the kind words. Uh, I'd like to share the screen and start my presentation. Uh, hopefully every, everybody can see my screen if any problem please uh, let me know so uh, first of all thank you very much i uh, i computer society bangladesh for arrange, arranging such a wonderful interaction lecture series and for inviting me in such a prestigious lecture series so i think this is the final day of the lecture series. So as we are going to a, a very uh, dangerous uh, coronavirus pandemic in the civilization of, in the human civilization. So I would like to basically concentrate on the research challenges that artificial intelligence or the machine learning, which can be used to fight against the COVID-19. So in today's lecture, basically, here is my outline. That is, I will first discuss on the capability of artificial intelligence of the machine learning. So in the capability of artificial intelligence and machine learning, I will try to place them in the context of COVID-19 and as well as 
try to identify or determine the area of research that needs to be focused by the computer scientist to fight COVID-19. And this will be followed by a number of use cases that are being developed or being researched by my research team. And finally, I will conclude. So here we go. I, that is, as you can see uh, in my right set, uh, there is a name of the book, Prediction Mechanics Machines. Uh, it was in 2017 when I was in the book store of John uh, J.F.K. Yarput in United, uh, in New York. I purchased this uh, Prediction Machines book. So basically I come across a very wonderful idea about the prediction machines. So actually I was amazed by a line which I would like to quote, when the price of something fundamental drops significantly, the whole world can change. So this is a very important statement of the propositions. That is the fundamental, when the price of something fundamental drastically change, then the world can change. So now we need to identify the, what is the fundamental things that we are looking here in this uh, lecture series. Uh, so in my view, I think uh, this fundamental things is the prediction. That is, uh, because, because prediction in a sense is very costly. And if you can reduce the price of prediction significantly, that is if you can uh, take the challenge how to reduce the price of prediction, then we can make the world in the way we would like. Dr. Shadat, your microphone has been muted. Please unmute it. Okay now. Is it okay? Yes, okay. Okay. So uh, let me. Uh, so sorry for the. Uh, interruptions. So I am talking of the prediction machine is the book. So the statement I would like to quote from this book is that when the price of something fundamental drops significantly, the whole world can change. So the fundamental things in my view is the predictions. That is, we need to uh, reduce the cost of the prediction because prediction in a sense is very costly. So we need to find a way. So this is a challenge for the artificial intelligence research set, that is how you reduce the price of the petitions in a very cheap price. Once you can make the petition very cheap, then you will change the world in the way you look. So that's why machine learning approaches various techniques. We are trying to reduce the price of the predictions. And if we can reduce the price of the prediction, if you can predict uh, something complex, with a very less support, less computing power, then the complex situation can be manageable. Mm -hmm. And in this prediction, uncertainty is also at the core of this prediction. This also needs to be addressed. That is, what is the accuracy level of these predictions? And such prediction will create a lot of opportunity uh, to face some problem. So the COVID-19 is an example of such a complex situation where prediction plays an integral part of its various component, uh, like the risk assessment of the COVID-19 or in the molecular structure, like the genome sequence classification of the real-time evaluation of the pathogens, for example, or the discovery of the vaccine of the drug or the treatment uh, or the diagnosis of the COVID-19 uh, patient. So here is the uh, origin and transmission diagram that I would like to 
show you. So from this diagram, basically we would like to identify some interesting things at the left you can see, uh, here is the uh, molecular structure of the coronavirus. And then you can see everybody of us know that the source of this coronavirus is bad. And then, uh, but it has some uh, phylogenetic and genomical similarity things, and it can transmit from, the, there could be direct transmission, and there could be human to human transmission, which we call social transmission, which is very dangerous. So after the transmission of the infected person, then we need to go for the treatment. So from this diagram, we can see the origin of the molecular structure as well as the transmission in the society and in the treatment uh, type of things. And then you can see the phylogenetic network of the coronavirus. As you all of you know that the coronavirus of Singapore, basically Italy got the coronavirus from Singapore, then New York got the from the Europe, but the is, is uh, genome sequence is mutated. We know that, but there is a challenge that is how can we uh, predict the mutations of the genome sequence. And in the uh, coronavirus uh, risk assessment framework as developed by the uh, USA CDC. So there are a number of stages uh, that is the investigation, regulations of the initiation and the acceleration. In each of the stages, prediction plays a very important role. If we can predict in a very simple way, in a very cheap way, we can control the situation in a better way. If we can predict when will be the peak level of this uh, epidemic in a country, then we can take the measure earlier. And also you can see you are very much acquainted with this peak level of the flattening the curve. If we don't go for any intervention, then there could be a peak. If we have some intervention like the lockdown of the social distance or the personal housing types of factory, then it will flatten the curve, meaning that it will uh, give less uh, impact on the hospital systems. So hospital system can cope with the uh, pandemic. So uh, everywhere there is a uh, problem with the prediction, accurate predictions. And also uh, this terms now it is very widely used that is the reproduction rate of this disease. Uh, this is called the RQ value. For measles, it is about 15, but for coronavirus, we have found that it is about three or four, meaning that if one person is infected by this uh, coronavirus, then in a month, 400 people could be infected. So its uh, growth rate is, is exponential. So from this brief discussion, what we have seen that uh, the area of or the domain of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning could be in the area number one, could be in the analyzing the molecular structure of the coronavirus, that is the genome sequence or the prediction of the protein or the drug discovery or the vaccine discovery. And also about the treatment, diagnosis of the outcome, predictions, and then in the uh, societal side, which is related to the, to the epidemiology, uh, that is, we can do a lot of research in the societal side, like the, uh, we would like to generate the scenario under a certain intervention, what will be the scenario. So that's why uh, I have determined three areas uh, that can be focused uh, by the AI or the machine learning researcher. One could be the molecular side related to the genome sequence or the protein structure prediction, drug discovery, vaccine discovery. Another one is the clinical site improvement of the uh, diagnosis or the treatment or the outcome. And the societal side, uh, contact tracing, uh, simulation, or the, to see the effect of the certain policy in the society to control. So societally, you can say in a non, pharmaceutical type of procedure, how to control the outbreak of this disease. So in the molecular side, I, I would like to uh, now present some cases that, that our present research is going on. Uh, we have applied the 
deep learning approach to classify the coronavirus uh, using some genome sequence data. So before that, I would like to uh, discuss the coronavirus molecular structure in the right side of my slide. You can see in the center, uh, this is the RNA. So basically genome sequence. So here you can see the genome sequence land and uh, different subsection of this genome sequence uh, related to uh, uh, certain, because this RNA is responsible for translating different types of protein. So among those protein, a spike protein is very dangerous. So this portion of the genome sequence, that is the S, is responsible for translating the protein. So the challenge uh, for the pharmacist or, or other people, that is uh, those people who are involved with inventing the drug or the vaccine, that is how to switch off this portion of the uh, genome sequence uh, as portion so that the production or the translation of the uh, spike protein uh, can be off. So the outbreak of the virus in the human body can be controlled significantly. So in order to do this research, here is our architecture which consists, which is talking about the pre-processing of the data, then the training, uh, then the testing type of things. Basically, we have collected data from the NCBI data set. We have now about 4,000 genome sequence data is now available. And the length of this uh, genome sequence data is about, as you can see, 29,750. So in our case, we have divided 29,750 uh, set base of data by 300. That is, we divided it into 100. And in this way, you have got about 4,000 type of records, then we use it uh, in our systems. I would like to share some of the result. Among the result, we have seen that convolutional neural network give the highest accuracy with 99% accuracy. And we have considered other types of matrices like the precision recall, like one square. And we compared with the traditional machine learning model like the SBM, random forest logistic integration as you can see uh, from the table. And here is the receiver operating characteristic curve. This is also showing the accuracy of uh, our model in terms of area under curve. And in case of uh, CNN, you can see the accuracy is about 0.98. And then we have validated our system using some Bangladesh data, Deshi data. So this is our architecture how we have developed our evaluation system. So interestingly, so far, as we checked yesterday, 19 genome sequence data uploaded in the NCBI data set. But we have uh, analysis considered only nine uh, genome sequence data. From this data, you can see the data, genome sequence data that we received uh, from NIV. So it contains some sorts of error because some of the uh, subsections is related to the four types of coronavirus. As you can, as you know, that is the, there are seven types of coronavirus, four of them is not harmful to the human being, but three of them is harmful. One is SARS-CoV-1, which we have seen in China during November 2002, and the MARS, uh, that is in uh, Saudi Arabia in 2012. And, uh, and also we have seen some uh, subsections uh, of uh, MARSCOP uh, in NIV data. So here we would like to see the result uh, that is uh, the machine, basically the accuracy what we have observed, it depends upon the types of machines they use. If we uh, consider the Sibasu, that is the Veterinary University, uh, their prediction is 100%. While an IV that I, I mentioned, this prediction is about 87, 88%. So in this way, this classification can also be support the uh, testing process. Basically, the goal standard that we use the PCR system. Although PCR has a limitation that uh, it's a false negative rate is high. Basically, we are getting 70% accuracy in type of PCR. So this is also a matter of concern from us. That is how 
we the computer scientists or the AI people can address these issues. And then, I, as I mentioned earlier, that is the phylogenetic network. And we are also working with the prediction of the mutation. And there are two different types of novel coronavirus mutation. One is S type and another one is L type, which is very much aggressive. So basically, artificial neural network is also used to uh, predict the mutation. So in this case, the base data of one genome sequence used as input to the input layer of the neural network, then the output layer, similar number of base data of the genome sequence we got, and then we check the similarity of the second genome sequence with the output data. So if it is uh, the similarity is 70%, then those data is all again input into the neural network. In this way, the process going on and ultimately we can uh, able to predict some uh, the mutation uh, based on this data. So however, uh, uh, we, have, we are developing a system considering the deep learning model uh, uh, which in this case we are considering 90% similarity and we are getting some interesting result. So here we would like to show you a very another interesting of research that is how we have used the belief rule based XPAS system to discover the drug for the COVID 19. So uh, you can see the steps of the drug discovery is that we need to identify the disease, then we need to isolate the protein, then we need to find a drug uh, against this disease, and there are some trial, and you need to get uh, permission to do the tra tra uh, testing trial. Uh, from the some uh, authority like the in case of US FDA, you know, in case of Bangladesh drug uh, department. So, in, uh, so just uh, I am just introducing the concept of belief rule based expert system. It's a very unique expert system. Recently, one of my students did his PhD uh, in this uh, area. So, uh, belief rule based we use as knowledge representation schema and the uh, Evidential reasoning as the inference engine, and there is example of uh, belief rule base. Basically, it used the if then rule. So this is the extension of the if then rule. And but in the consequent part, we use a belief structure, uh, which you can see we uh, allocate the degree of belief, and it could be conjunctive BRB and the disjunctive BRB. And here is the inference procedure of the belief rule base, which consists of. Uh, four steps and the beauty of the belief role base is that it can address the Interruption, internet interruption. Uh, I, I think all of you can hear. So, can you please give me a shout? Are yes, you yes, hearing? Yes, oh, it's okay. Now. okay th thank you. Yes. And you can see this is the aspirin chemical structure of this aspirin drug and the artemisinin. Sir, sir can you please share your screen again?
Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is the chemical structure of a sparing drug and the artemisinin, and you can see a molecular weight and H1, the parameter that we have considered. So here is our uh, belief rule-based structure. As you can see, at 16, we would like to discover the COVID-19 drug. And in the mid-level node, uh, which is uh, A11, is related to the physiochemical parameters. And under the physiochemical parameter, you can see A1, A2, A3, A4. Uh, these are related to the molecular one number H bone and A4. So basically, uh, in this tree, that is, we need the 10 input data. So what we have done, we have collected input data for about 50 drug, uh, which can be considered for a suitable candidate for the uh, COVID-19. Uh, all of you are uh, now familiar with, uh, uh, that is the remdesivir, uh, which is uh, considered as a very effective drug and approved by the FDA of uh, USA. So using the parameter value of Remdesivir, we uh, use our belief rule-based expert system. As you can see, so this, the possibility of becoming this drug, it is the COVID-19, it is about 93.79%. And uh, when we have uh, considered the input data of retinavid drug, then uh, its possibility of becoming COVID-19 drug is 76%. So in this way, uh, the pharmacist can try different existing drug, which will become a candidate drug uh, for the COVID-19. So these systems uh, will give a very good opportunity to do this. So that is research is uh, under, undergoing. And then uh, we have discussed about the molecular part where we have discussed about the genome sequence classification, mutation prediction, Dust discovery. Now, the other components of the application domain of machine learning or artificial intelligence is the clinical side, where we can use the machine learning model in the diagnosis process or the treatment or outcome prediction. I would like to share some use case. Uh, we have uh, considered some x ray images and we use the deep learning to predict the uh, condition of the patient of COVID 19. Uh, so in this uh, research, our aim is to prepare some standard data set and then the, select the optimal pre-trained CNN model. You know, there, are, there exist so many pre-trained CNN model now. And we have, by doing some augmentation, we have increased the uh, image, number of images of the data set, considering these augmented parameters, as you can see. Then this is the architecture of our deep learning, uh, deep neural network. And then here is some result as you can see here. But we, we are now working on extending this uh, uh, research by integrating the belief rule ways uh, with the deep learning. Actually this type of integration, recently we did lots of work which we had publication in a very reputed journal. So in this case, as you can see here, this is a very interesting say, CNN model or traditional uh, machine learning model. Basically, they are data driving approach. But if we can combine both the data driving and the knowledge driving, especially with the capability of handling the uncertainty, uh, so, so this will definitely give better result as we have seen from our previous success. So in addition to the uh, output, we have also considered in this case, uh, that is the other risk factor like the disease, heart disease, other parameters. Then we are trying to survive, predict the survival probability of the COVID patient using these systems. And then another uh, case study, that is we are developing BRBS to assess the suspicion of COVID-19 for your information. I, I did a lot of works in the suspicion or the assessment of other diseases. Uh, if you uh, go through my Google Scholar site, then you will find. So this is the uh, BRB structure that we are developing. That is so in this way, that is in a multiple ways we are trying to, uh, we can help we, the AI researcher or machine learning researcher can use our knowledge to help the 
testing, prediction, or various domain of this uh, deadly disease in the civilization of human being. Then the last component is the societal. It is related to the epidemiological or the infodemic misinformation also creates some problem. And we, I would like to show uh, some of my current research where we have develop some system which will simulate and predict the effect of COVID-19 in Bangladesh. We are considering SCIR model, uh, which is uh, which consists of four compartments, susceptible, uh, exposure, infectious, recovered, and we need to consider a number of parameters. You can see transmission rate, onset rate, removal rate. And I would like to share some results. As you can see, on June 17, the number of confirmed cases in Bangladesh is 81,523. And our system with a reproduction rate, that is the R value, as I mentioned earlier with 2.1, it is predicting 82,377. 82, that is uh, our prediction is near to 97 or 96%. Or if we can see the previous seven days or uh, coming seven days, so the uh, accuracy is in between 94 to 98%. Most in interesting in the right side diagram, you can see using this uh, model, we can predict the peak level. So there, for example, if you consider the uh, R value as two, then the prediction peak level will reach on 18 July with confirmed case of 170,000. But uh, if we consider uh, predict uh, RQ value 2.1, then the peak level will reach on 17 July with confirmed case of 184,000. And then uh, you can uh, generate different scenarios considering different intervention date. If you uh, consider intervention date as 14, then under different RQ value, as you can say, 1.9, 1 1.5, 1 uh, 1.2, you can uh, generate the peak level value with the time. And most importantly, as you know, when the RQ value less than one, then epidemic is controlled. That is, there will be no outbreak. But if it is uh, more than one, then there is an outbreak. So in this way, policymaker there can analyze their intervention, whether this is lockdown or social distancing, other method using uh, the systems. And so the beauty of this model is that you can apply not only at the national level, but for any administrative unit of Bangladesh. For example, for the Chitong city, the first confirmed case found on 3rd April 2020, and we have developed the model for Chitong city, considering different RQ value. And you can also do it for any upozilla, and we did it for Shatkani upozilla. You can do it for Inuan, you can do it for uh, uh, so basically, this will give you an intelligent approach of when the uh, business will close or when the business will open. Because in my view, we need to live with the coronavirus at least for the next five years. So we need to know as in an intelligent way. We need to develop an intelligent strategic approach when to open our business, when to close our business. So, and also, as I mentioned earlier, that transmission rate is very important. And we, are, we have also developed and belief rule based considering some factors like the social distance, you can apply this uh, system considering any uh, region or the upozala or the village, uh, considering this factor, how is the practice of personal hygiene? Uh, if you can give this data, uh, then you can uh, translate, uh, you can calculate the transmission rates. Uh, for example, in our case, we have found it is 0.4 to 9. There is some mathematical formula. Uh, there is a relationship between transmission rate and the reproduction rate. Basically, this transmission rate is the uh, probability of interaction between the infected per person uh, and the exposure per person. And we are also uh, working with the developing the app, that is, we convert this, our model into app. Uh, and uh, we have uh, gone through about 100 apps so far developed. And we can categorize it into four categories. Uh, that is, one is tracing tools, assessment tools, information tools. Most importantly, the DX assessment framework that we have 
discuss when you will develop the apps you need to address those uh, criteria so always uh, same apps will not work its functionality dynamically needs to be changed so this need to be looked at when we will design or the develop the app so the app that we have developed it has the function that is you can use the confirm case predict the simulate the graph peak level uh, if you want to use our app uh, we can share the link anybody can download it then you can use it and here is the snapshot of our apps these are the functionality and you can see using this app uh, if you give some just uh, simple data rq value uh, or the incubation period or the infection period you can easily uh, uh, generate the peak level value you can put rq value so in this way i think you can play uh, anybody can analyze the coronavirus situation or develop the policy uh, or, or assess the policy which is taken out to control the coronavirus using this app so here i would like to conclude that is we have discussed the application domains of ai in different covid 19 scenarios and uh, ai or the machine learning has a very important role to play in three domains like the molecular and the clinical and the societal but most importantly uncertainty is a very important factor because and uncertainty research in three areas like the molecular or the clinical uh, or the societal so we need an appropriate ai methodology to address this so i would like to introduce you my my team so here is the dr talha he is a pharmacist he is uh, working with us with the drug discovery then we have tausinuddin uh, he is a uh, erasmus mundus scholar he will go to do, pursue his masters uh, this uh, august of september he is working with the uh, extra image analysis and the uh, jamil uh, he is also a erasmus mundus scholar he will start his masters from uh, next september he is working the belief rule based expert system nazbun nahar lecturer of this trust university he is working in the area of brb and we have rakib working with the drug discovery we have shafkat working on the genome sequence analysis and the mutation prediction we have jisat working with the epidemiological model and developing the app so in this way i would like to thank you all for your passion sharing please for forgive me i seek apology because there is some interruption which is out of my control thank you very much if you have any question i will happy to answer this uh, thank you very much uh, professor dr shahadat uh for your nice presentation now uh, i would like to raise your hand to ask question uh, here you can see that uh, mr aminur rahman ashik has raised your hand please uh, ask your question we uh, samin please uh, unmute uh, mr aminur rahman ashik sir um, maybe only bhule hatho sastra sir ki okay then anyone uh, please uh, raise your hand to ask any question regarding uh, the presentation of shahadat hosain okay uh, if there is no question we are actually running out of time uh, we have a full speaker is there any question no so one question abdul ala okay please walid assalam alaikum <clears throat> sir i have a question that uh, whenever we want to classify the uh, x ray uh, images of heart and uh, when and how can we collect the data set so this is the this is my question actually there are uh, say there, there are some uh, website say kaggle and cbi i think you can collect the data from kaggle okay so uh, so if i if i uh, try to uh, classify my own data set uh, just like i have collect the data from uh, different uh, hospital in bangladesh so it will be efficient for me actually in order to apply the deep learning that is you need to have a large volume of data uh, 
So you can also do that when data is not available. Uh, but there are some issues that is about the preposition of the standard si size of the data, which will fit with this model. So uh, there is a very challenging task in the area of preprocessing steps. If you can address this, then it can turn into a, a standard data set as well. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you uh, for your question and answer. Uh, sir, now uh, actually uh, uh, we want to move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Neelan Jonde. Uh, I would like to have a brief discussion about uh, Dr. Neelan Jonde, uh, our uh, speaker for session four. Dr. Nilanjundi is an assistant professor in the Department of Information and Information Technology at Techno International Newtown, formerly known as Techno Indian College of Technology, Kolkata, India. He is a visiting fellow of the University of Reading, UK, and also a visiting professor at Titan University, Vietnam. Mr. De was an honorary visiting scientist as at Global Biomedical Technologies Incorporation, California, USA, since 2012 to 2015. He was awarded his doctoral degree from Jadavpur University in 2015. Dr. Nilanjan is the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Ambient Computing and Intelligence, IGI Global, Scopus Wave of Science. He is the series co-editor of Springer Tracks in Nature Inspired Computing, Springer Nature, series co-editor uh, co of Advances in Ubiquitous Sensing Applications for Healthcare under Elsevier, and series editor of Computational Intelligence in Engineering Problem Solving, Intelligent Signal Processing and Data Analysis, CRC. Dr. Nilanjan has authored and edited more than 80 books with Springer, Elsevier, Willie, and CRC Press, and published more than 400 peer-reviewed research papers. His main research interests include medical imaging, machine learning, computer-aided diagnosis, data mining, etc. He is the Indian Ambassador of International Federation of Information Processing, IFIP Young ICT Group. Now, I would like to uh, request uh, Mr. Nilanjan De to present his uh, talk. Welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Namaskar Swabaike. Uh, today, my topic is uh, implementation of AI enabled technologies to fight COVID 19. Uh, for any kind of AI enabled uh, technologies, there are different types of benefits. So, in COVID 19, uh, we already gone through. Uh, couple of benefits I mean uh, already actually I mean passes through one is autonomous everything second is pervasive knowledge third is assistive technology fourth one is the intelligent decision support so in la last couple of months actually we started working on COVID from February week first week uh, in this couple of months uh, three four months there is a huge revolution in speeding up the technologies so this presentation is just to showcase the series of examples of technologies where the AI is infused uh, with uh, other techniques. So infusion of AI. Now, let's start from uh, infection risk identification, which is very first line of defense against COVID-19 pandemic. So it's an in-home risk assessment. Anybody can check through some mobile apps. And it is very common nowadays where there will be a questionnaire based on the questionnaire, somebody who is feeling well or not well, who visited or not visited based on the questionnaire, the medical expert should assess those questionnaires. And after that, they will come up with a risk level. And I, ICT and AI actually helps a lot uh, to come up with this decision making system. So well-being of this user to identify the risk level 
and now these mobile apps are very common and widely used in most of the countries but uh, in this case where actually the thing is the input uh, is basically the question answer it might be symptotic and asymptotic there will be several layers or levels or nodes intermediate nodes and finally we will come up with a risk level so in this entire process there is a decision rules which needs to be there incorporated in the ai i mean which is generated by ai algorithm and finally we will get some risk level so in the back end there is an ai which actually uh, comes up with this decision making helps the decision making so to get the whole overall picture of a region where the virus outbreak is or how much out, outbreak is there so it needs to study the big data initially once we started working in february there was a problem of data which the data was a small data but after that now the data availability is not a big problem for this covid study uh, there are three challenges which needs to be conquered once we come up with those question here we need to identify the present and the current risk and also we need to predict the future risk so where the epicenter will move or the propagation rate that needs to be computed once there is a lots of question here will come and answers that needs to be uh, put into a some big data infrastructure or cloud processing to come up with a updated results and lastly the visualization part is also important for assessment of those geographical data now uh, if we study this clustering this clustering actually gives the prediction uh, of next outbreak or the epicenter movement where the cluster represent the severity in fact different different coloring or the size of the cluster actually represent the severity level so this was the very first thing which actually uh, we start we can start from home it's a in home thing which the basically is a very first line of risk assess assessment but the problem of this mobile application uh, ai enabled things that is the trust issue means uh, the user who are providing the data might not be fully honest or there might be human i mean it should be human bias sometime it might happen so what actually happens the most of the cases the risk assessment is uh, not exactly uh, correct so that time uh, it is very important uh, to come up with some other secondary technique so smart screening of high body temperature is the second technique where there is a need of uh, mass screening in the airport in the uh, stations restaurant everywhere we need uh, mass screening and high body temperature is one of the common symptom of covid-19 and uh, there is a well established technology that is called the itis where infra thermal image scanner are used for this border control and the mass screening for the travelers and uh, the fever symptoms to find out and in fact the roc is 0.86 and accuracy is 95% which is uh, quite good and uh, once we intact the ai technologies with itis then might be it is very easy to identify a particular person and to measure the body temperature whenever the person is moving even if the person is moving so the speeding up the screening process there is a high need or high demand to design some system or the i mean infrastructure which actually cope up with this scenario where the object is uh, moving very fast that needs to be tracked and we have to identify the person maybe the face because the rest of the body parts are covered by some dress so face is one area where you can take the body we can take the body temperature so we have to locate that and we have to track that person so in this way uh, this vision computing actually helps very uh, i mean very much for this rapid detection and tracking of this thermal images now in this case the image of the coming frames are very much dynamic in nature so lots of video frames are coming so that needs a huge storage space once the video frames are coming that needs to be target detection it can be done by frame differencing there can be flow identification that is motion vector or kind of thing or say for foreground background subtraction to find out the region of interest then after that we can go for classification based on the temperature based on the say spatial information or the shape information features then after that it needs to be tracked or the a uh, target track needs to be by point based might be contour based might be frame based so basically there are two categories one is detection one is tracking detection is the face detection mainly and tracking once a face is properly identified 
that moving phase until out of view, uh, we have to locate that phase or we have to chase that phase. So this is basically tracking to avoid multi-trigger detection. So these are the, say this is a second part. And the third thing is the deep learning and radiological image analysis. Uh, actually in this area, lots of work are currently going on. People have tried deep learning and uh, various types of deep learning. And it is very well established that in medical, medical imaging, uh, it gives very prominent, I mean, good results. But the problem is the it's very expensive. Uh, equipments are very expensive for the radiologist. So uh, CT images of where we actually deals with series of X-ray images from the cross section of lung at different uh, depths. And we need to find out the irregularity in the tissue. Now, in, in this case, it is very hard to distinguish because the main reason is COVID and the vital pneumonia. This case is, this distinguish is very difficult. But still, uh, deep learning works most of the cases very nice because the characteristic of the COVID, apart from the, I mean, the traditional features are very prominent. So now it is, uh, I mean, many people are working in this area where uh, even from starting from that shallow machine learning to up to deep, deep learning, finding out the region of pre-processing uh, the diaphragm images or finding out the region of interest. And after that uh, uh, shape study or by studying that particular likelihood of that region, uh, the presence of the COVID, uh, what is the positive level or uncertainty level uh, by a pro uh, probabilistic modeling. So it's kind of, uh, say, people use starting from CNN, uh, uh, might be softmax will give some prediction value. Uh, life is happy. So now, until now, so many people are working in this area. Even in our group from Delhi IIT also, with our collaborators, we used transformation learning. We used uh, some quantum-inspired algorithms and uh, nature-inspired algorithms also to uh, go for this segmentation and classification kind of works. So these are a few of the works are listed. And uh, then after that, uh, the people who are actually working from the very font, that is the healthcare workers or the hospital radiologist who are actually uh, lots of loads uh, they are having because too, much, too many numbers of patients are there. And you need to come up with a system which will, uh, I mean, decide who needs to be isolated, who needs to be quarantined or uh, confirmed cases or treatment, need for the treatment. And InfraVision is a uh, kind of software, which is very firstly reported kind of AI uh, enabled software, COVID diagnosis, where 34 hospitals in China, they actually examined almost 32K uh, suspected cases. But the most interesting part is the time taken, uh, actually from 15 minutes, it, uh, uh, I mean, uh, become, three minutes. So there is a huge reduction and that reduction helps uh, foster diagnosis. Now, the, another case study, I mean, another thing is the AI-driven unmanned, unmanned technologies. And we all know that once AI comes into the picture, we need to replace the healthcare workers or the caregivers. Means uh, if, even if they are maintaining the social distances, but in fact, if there is no human touch, uh, or very less human touch, there is a chance of this infection risk is very, will be very less. So the borders are locked, so physical teamwork are impossible and health workers who are directly interacting with the patient or the suspected ones or the elderly uh, people who are actually needs emotional support in this time because they are into the priority group and most vulnerable to the virus or the police officers or the traffic police who are working in the ground level. In these, all these cases, one thing is very common. Actually, we need to eliminate or minimize the cost or, uh, I mean, human interaction needs to be reduced. So the substitute can be robots. So in robots, robotics and AI at hospitals, or hospitals is basically the hotspot because most frequently the patient confirmed cases or the suspected cases they are visiting. So based on that, the patients, uh, I mean, the number of patients as they increases, it uh, become more vulnerable place. So what the thing is to ensure this, uh, the safety of the workers or the patient or the visitors, sometimes it is good uh, to substitute uh, human by robots because robot is a kind of thing where there is a risk factor is very less because it's a machine and almost impossible for virus infection. Or there are some consumer products like floor cleaning boats are there 
which can uh, easily clean the hospitals every time. So uh, one another thing we I, actually I want to share that is a uh, I mean germ medical lamps. It's a uh, uh, kind of UV ray where it actually emits, which disinfecting the surfaces. So it's a kind of uh, lamp which is mobile UV lamp kind of which kills the germs. So the unique feature is it's AI enabled. It can it can self navigate. It can go for optimizing the shortest path. It can maximizing the cleaning area or object avoidance if there is any chance of collision. Second case, like uh, caregiving robots, uh, it's tried to mimic the behavior of the nurses or the health workers, like uh, it works as a housekeeper who actually provides the food or the drug delivery or the waste collection or sometimes measuring the parameters of patients. So like one example is Amigo, like it's a, a patient care robot. Uh, we all know about virtual doctors and virtual nurse, nurse now. In fact, in Italian hospitals, uh, it's already, uh, there is a well-established techniques where uh, in ICU pa patient, they are interacting uh, with the dialogues and informations. So these are the robots which are working, uh, not as it might be as a substitute of nurse, but with the nurse. Third is the blood sampling robot where this AVD actually works very nice. They try to locate the insert point in the vein, I mean, on the blood vein. Then they try to, uh, I mean, take the sample very quickly, sometimes much more faster than the human also, as they claim. So this is the third category of robots. And there is another category of robots, which is basically the hospital, uh, I mean, triage, uh, where actually you find in patrolling robots are there, or they some are serving patient in the triage or information chaos or spreading uh, disinfectants. So these are different types of robots uh, people are using. Another thing in public places, AI also use like in, uh, uh, I mean, law enforcement, if somebody is not wearing the mask, uh, might be there is a warning. So UAV actually works in very nice in this type of cases. In some other case studies in UAV, like, like in uh, Chicago, they are uh, coming up with some virtual tour kind of thing. Sometimes it delivers the medicine, sometimes it delivers the toilet papers or say keys, car keys. Uh, rental businesses, which actually helps. So ground robots is a, uh, basically one type of robots where AI algorithms are localization, pathfinding, and computer vision for autonomous navigation. Medical robots where actually we need the precision, high precision kind of robots image by image processing. And UAV where there is a on pair, uh, I mean, on pair navigation system, which should be capable along with the ground robots. I mean, ground robots should be, should be capable to do those things. So these are the three uh, prominent category. Uh, in COVID-19, this lockdown period, we actually uh, come through many different types of robots like sanitizing robots, like uh, blood test robot, hospital, uh, I mean, triage robots, yeah, caregiving robots, lockdown patrol robots or delivery robots. Uh, this is one of the book which might publish within a week. Uh, this entire things actually contains, I have taken from one of the chapter of this book. And this is written by two of my colleague, a co-researcher. One is a Simon Fong, Professor Simon Fong from University of Macau and Dr. Jyoti Smita Chaki from VIT Velo. Uh, you can go through this book. There are other uh, aspects of this uh, different, different studies of COVID are also discussed in this book. Uh, so how much time our doctor used to spend per patient in India. The surprising number is two minutes, two to 2.3 minutes. And in states, it's almost 21 minutes. It's a, a report, I mean, this news was coming. Uh, we have uh, actually, uh, uh, remaining five or uh, eight minutes, it will <laughs> to finish. I will, I will conclude, no problem. Okay. Okay. So in Times of India 2017, they come up with a report and this India actually uh, per, per patient, a doctor used to give two minutes time. And in Bangladesh, the numbers are, I mean, surprising. It's 48 seconds. So we need AI-enabled CAD system to come up with faster decision-making system, which will actually help the doctor to come up faster decision and unbiased decision. I mean, it should be a second opinion to the radiologist. Too many people are working in this area. Actually, we don't know what will happen in post-pandemic and what will be the scenario of the healthcare industry. But this is very, uh, I mean, a common fact. 
that there are some certain cases like the remote monitoring or virtual case uh, caring or say automation in the uh, contactless patient management or AI powered customer support, they are coming into the picture. So there is a lots of uh, research area which are very open in this, uh, this uh, part, I, I want to say, this AI enabled CAD system where uh, most of the CAD system where, which should be very low cost, which should be portable devices kind of thing, which should be uh, sometimes very less and, uh, contact needs to be there. So this type of devices is required. Uh, thanks for your kind patience and suggestion. Shabai bhalo thakben. Boro kothin shomoy. If anybody having any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you uh, for your nice presentation and very informative uh, research news. Uh, now I'd like to uh, request the participants to ask questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, uh, unmute then ask questions. So, so, Dr. Nilanjana, one question actually about the we are getting data, but the accuracy of data, what's about the accuracy? Is there any problem about the accuracy of the available data? No, no, um, pardon the accuracy of the system or the data? Data, data. That means uh, data. Those are we uh, using in the. That means uh, feeding in the system. But uh, that means if data is noisy, then actually it will be a problem for our models. Correct. Means uh, most of the cases that data is very low quality data as yeah, that's data. A big problem, actually. Because uh, because there are speckle the kind of noise are there. So to remove speckle kind of noise and most of the cases not only speckle noise there are other different types of noise are there. So uh, if the data is a diacom data, might be it is good, but uh, getting oh. diacom data is not so easy. So initially yes. there was a, a, some cases super pixel study or uh, this kind of thing can be done to, uh, for, I mean, go for pre-processing. But again, this pre-processing not always works fine because most of the cases, if you go for pre-processing, the age information, I mean, it's it getting lost. So if you don't have the proper age information, safe study will not give a proper answer. I mean, results. So these type of issues are there. So sir, but still, I think, I mean, somehow we need a certain number of uh, data, which is well tested data and might be uh, in a public uh, domain, which is already posted and people have started working on it. So that data needs to be benchmarked and we have to augment data. Yes. Yes. In these uh, three, four papers, which I actually shown in this uh, in one slide, where we use different types of augmentation techniques, not only deep learning, apart from deep learning also, very other, other different types of augmentation to increase the number of data for deep learning. So it's an it's a, uh, issue means uh, you have to trust that uh, the benchmark data. Yes, yes, yes. Otherwise, yes. it is very difficult. We have no benchmark so far, actually. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Shamsul Arifin and uh, Nirandan Dev uh, for your nice discussion. Now, uh, we are actually running out of time. We have uh, uh, another thank two you very speakers much. up there. Yeah. So, so, I would like to again thanks from IT Bully Computer Society Bangladesh chapter to uh, Professor Dr. Shahadat Hoshen, our first speaker, and the second speaker, Dr. Nilanjan Dev, for your nice talk uh, for our participants. Now, I would like to hand over my uh, uh, moderation ship to Professor Dr. Shamsul Arifin to introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Alamgir Hoshin. Professor Dr. Shamsul Arifin, sir. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Parak Hassan. So, it's my pleasure uh, to be in this session. So, and also pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Alamgir Hussain, sir. Actually, he is a pioneer of computer education in Bangladesh in early 90s. So, now I am going through his short bio. Professor Dr. Alam, Alamgir Hussain is currently serving as the head of Digital Research and Innovation, National Horizon Center, Testside University, UK. Prior to this, he also served in the Angelia Rushkin University at Cambridge as a director of IT Research Institute, University of Northern Barria at Newcastle as a head of computational intelligence, University of Bradford, University of Sheffield, 
Sheffield Hallam University and the University of Dhaka. In University of Dhaka, he served as the head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He has extensive research experience in computational intelligence, medical image processing, bioinformatics, cyber security, intelligent decision, digital diagnosis, then mobile and our expert system. Professor Hussain has led many large EU and UKRI funded projects as an, as an international lead investigator, worth over 16 million pound. With a publication in Nature, he has published over 300 referred research articles, contributed 12 books, received the F.C. Williams 1996 award for an IET journal, UK, Lifetime Achievement Award, Channel S, London, and Best Paper Awards for five conference articles. I have to add one thing here. The, the field of research and different conference in the field of computing and computer science and information technology started with the initiatives of Professor Dr. Alongir sir from 1998. So actually he is a pioneer in the field of computer and computing technology in Bangladesh. I request uh, Professor Alongir sir, please start your talk. Thank you. Good morning, Assalamu alaikum, Namaskar. I hope you all are okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Full screen, Good. sir. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed two other presentations. Uh, my apologies for the time related issue because I thought it's 11 o'clock. I joined 10 past 10. Uh, and I enjoyed the two other presentation. Professor Shahadat uh, did fantastic job. And uh, Dr. Nilan Jande, uh, something we are trying to do with India and many other countries you might see in my presentation. So uh, we should continue uh, communication even after the presentation. Uh, so feel free to send me an email. Right. Thank you for kind work of the of the uh, introducer. Uh, I'm just showing some of the work we are trying to do, rather a specific research area. Uh, so one uh, particular uh, stimulation was from this project. Uh, this uh, was done in 2016 and 17 testing TV using mobile phone in real time with Malaysia. So although TB is not same as coronavirus, TB is a bacteria and coronavirus is a little bit different context, but there are quite a lot of similarity or synergy where we can uh, use the knowledge uh, from the same domain at here. So that's something uh, uh, I was trying to capitalize with uh, many of my former PhD students, current PhD students, and some of my colleagues. Uh, if you want to see the details of that, uh, the published paper is over there, so you can see uh, that details. The whole idea is can we use biosensor, can we use genome sequence, can we use uh, history analysis, symptom analysis, influence of other diseases, like we all can see the comorbidity and multimorbidity issue uh, for COVID-19 uh, problem. And can we also connect it with health professionals? Can we connect with peer groups so that they can learn from each other how to survive? And can the application in the cloud so that someone can download and use mobile phone or digital devices uh, to have whole scenario? So it's like a care model uh, using digital technology. And that's one of the reasons my title here, you can see Digital Clinic for COVID-19. I personally believe in very near future, we'll see digital clinic around uh, us. 
even in the big city or even in virtual environment. Uh, there are some evidence already we can see over there. Right, moving back to my presentation. You can see the details in the, uh, in the published paper. So I'm moving to what are the key challenges country like Bangladesh. Last three months, we explored a lot to identify particularly the challenges um, of the low and lower middle income country. Because the, the work uh, I, I am particularly interested to, to contribute is to low and lower middle income country use AI enabled technology or digital technology as Dr. Nilanjan they indicated in his presentation. Uh, there are some synergy of his presentation we can uh, think of working together. We invited three Indian universities to, to join in the, one of the uh, project BDS meeting tomorrow. I'll let you know a little bit more in later stages. So first challenge is lack of healthcare professionals and caregivers. This indication is given previous speaker as well. Uh, and uh, the second challenge is uh, lack of knowledge and tools to empower and aid the health professionals. COVID-19 is a new challenge, so naturally our uh, health professionals need some sort of training, empowerment tools so that they can look after the patients better. And uh, many newly recruited health professionals and caregivers, they didn't get the training but we are putting them frontline and therefore it is a big challenge. The third one is the rapid testing tool. Existing PCR method is costly and not available in remote area. If we look at our patients, uh, let's say much more patients in outside hospital than inside hospital. So naturally looking after patients, large number of patients in every country is, is very challenging. Sorry, uh, can I request everyone to turn off the microphone unless you really want to interrupt. The fourth one is uh, limited uh, protection of supporting equipment and lack of knowledge or understanding how to use that. PP is a big challenge because many uh, hospital caregivers or health professionals, they are struggling uh, to uh, use proper PP and in appropriate method. So that's another big challenge for low, lower middle income country. And the fifth one is experts for modeling for a rapid responses. And this capacity relatively weaker because uh, the country as a whole not well structured, well prepared for these type of challenges. And country like Bangladesh, one of the key challenge in Bangladesh, uh, what I always uh, indicate in different uh, conference that uh, innovation. Uh, if we look at the uh, position of the country in innovation is absolutely, or very, very low, or absolutely weak and very, very low. So that's one of the problem we should think of how we can improve our research and innovation. Otherwise, any new challenges like this will be very, very difficult to address. Even country like UK or US or Italy, they are struggling. They have so much opportunity and ability uh, in terms of capacity, despite that they are struggling. So we need to think of a little bit more uh, uh, organized way to address that. All right. What can we do using AI and digital technology? Some of these indicated uh, the previous speaker. So rather just repeating everything, uh, I'll just put some of the keywords like comorbidity and multimorbidity related challenges. This is what we did uh, and submitted a paper in IEEE access, uh, still waiting for response. I'll show one particular result. Uh, and modeling, planning, resource management, as I indicated earlier, prediction uh, related to mental health, obesity, these are coming ahead. Uh, so all these challenges due to isolation uh, is, will be a big challenge. Modeling diversity of challenges like care homes, hotel, prison, cruises, own home, uh, patients are everywhere. So these all are different challenges. Therefore, more having a model to support them will be uh, very, very useful, particularly personalized predictive model. 
Dr. Nilanjan indicated some of uh, elements to that context uh, that can we generate personalized predictive model. Even UK NHS is targeting to develop predictive personalized model by 2024, 25. Some of these uh, are in progress, but this is a, a challenging element that can we generate our own model, how to look after uh, a particular patient based on his or her condition. Self-health management, monitoring, self-diagnosis, sequence analysis, all these uh, could be another core elements we should think of. Important challenges like impact of caregivers, nurses, doctors. So it's not only patients, we should also look after our uh, health professionals, uh, those who are working hard and saving lives. Challenge of service providers, for example, food, pharmacy, traffic, police, and so on. All these are part of the uh, process. Like in Bangladesh, I noticed there are many uh, police officers or uh, uh, staff uh, around police. Policing uh, has uh, quite a lot of problem. Monitoring surveillance, real-time support strategy, decision support making, and services policies, all these are important issues. So let's move on to next uh, element. Usually I show this slide uh, in many conferences and this is a common element that we need to analyze data to generate knowledge and AI could play a core key role at here. And if we can generate knowledge, we can utilize knowledge uh, for various purposes. So data may come in different form like from sensors or uh, data sets coming from different sources it could be numeric text, pictures, video, et cetera. So we do pre-processing. One of the question in the last session uh, was, uh, how can we remove the noise? Otherwise, the quality will be always a question. So that's why we do in pre-processing and then feature extraction out of that through mining, image processing, or audio processing, then processing over there for classification, clustering, learning, fusion, optimization visualization, and finally, knowledge for decision-making, identification, and prediction. So these opportunities are there. We can think of using different algorithms for different purpose, and uh, deep learning is, is popular now, for, particularly for image processing and large data set. So therefore, uh, there are opportunity to use deep learning in many uh, cases for COVID-19 uh, challenges. So this is a common slide I usually show because uh, these are the baseline we should uh, develop our capacity uh, in country like Bangladesh to understand how to generate knowledge out of data. Uh, one particular work we did uh, recently uh, with, uh, with the team, particularly Dr. Mahmoudul Hassan, one of, the, uh, one of my former PhD students now working in London, did this work and I really like the, uh, the out outline. So I just put one slide of our research outcome, the uh, paper we submitted in IEEE Excels. It's common morbidity and multi-morbidity survival issues with different age groups and who be data set was used. Uh, just to identify that uh, if age, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and uh, uh, the recovered patients and die patients we want to show <clears throat> then this is the picture we can we can uh, we can get uh, to understand the different challenges for comorbidity and multimorbidity so uh, what i propose uh, to look after our patients we need a caregivers model as dr nilanjan indicated uh, in one segment of his presentation and I personally propose caregivers model is not just uh, the, uh, the mobile enable app, but it could be linked with many elements uh, in, a, in an integrated form. So caregivers model, we should consider personalized, predictive, preventive, and prescriptive form uh, of the model. And if we look at uh, this form, this could be linked with the input or for the model like big data analysis, symptom analysis, self-diagnosis uh, element, engagement, empowerment, entertainment, and uh, support peer group type of activities. Some of these are indicated in the uh, TV testing project. And this may stimulated uh, 
particularly self-diagnosis may come from different form. And one of my view is we have to think of alternative, how we can develop mobile enable express system. Probably some of you noticed uh, in some of my previous presentation that I tried to use mobile phone for skin disease analysis, testing TB, I gave the example, retinal image analysis, uh, pathological tests like colorometric test. So some of these actually listed it here, what are the potential of self-diagnosis or community-based diagnosis. We have to think about uh, how we can actually develop solution for uh, outside hospital within community settings that could be at home, that could be in care homes, that could be in hotel, in, in cruise. So we need to think of this type of uh, opportunity using mobile phone with attachment or without attachment. So mobile phone can be attached with microscopic lens, thermal infrared camera, spectrometer, handle x-ray, biosensors, digital microscope, DNA sequence analyzer. So that may give an opportunity for self-diagnosis or community-based diagnosis. This self-diagnosis not necessarily only the individual, the patient himself have to do. It could be uh, community care providers or, you know, in Bangladesh we have now uh, healthcare uh, support workers in remote areas, so they can actually help uh, in many ways. And if we look at uh, the input may come for self-diagnosis, these are the elements we can think of. So for instance, if we th think of colorimetric test, we notice there are some uh, changes in saliva or sputum uh, or sweat or smell uh, in some cases. In COVID-19, uh, sputum color change or thickness is one particular element. And if you think of like, um, we, are we are proposing to use um, uh, endoscope, whether endoscope, endoscopic solution could help, whether biosensor based solution could help with mobile phone. So some of these uh, context we can bring, bring off uh, testing using mobile enable express system with the attachment of devices or sensors like that. And the empowerment is one of the core issue because there are many patients outside hospital and I heard initially Bangladesh engaged about 2000 uh, medical professionals to support uh, patients through online or mobile. And many of these can be actually addressed using mobile enable express system uh, as Professor Nilanjan, they actually indicated some of this context. So you have to think about developing augmented reality, virtual reality solution for, uh, for example, for PPE type of uh, use or quality of use or quality of materials type of uh, activities. The equipment and real time uh, guidance, uh, if there is any opportunity uh, to develop through AI and our decision support system could help. Right, so I'm nearly there. This is what I'm preparing. I was extremely busy <laughs> until yesterday. We are submitting a bid uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's a large bid. Uh, it's uh, involved 14 countries. Uh, you can see seven low income, low and lower middle income country, and four, uh, sorry, yeah, four high income country. So although Brazil is in high impacted country, but Brazil actually relatively uh, lower middle income country category. So the whole idea is, can we get the experience or learning lesson we learn from high impacted countries and help low income country like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And we also have associate country, Nepal, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam and Indonesia in the team. Uh, we are not allocating any budget for them, but they can actually get uh, access to our uh, caring and sharing framework. The whole idea is can we develop reusable adaptive sharing and caring framework uh, to address the pa pandemic challenges like uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much for uh, listening my uh, talk for your patience and all the best keep safe if you have any question please feel free to ask thank you thank you sir thank you sir for your nice in time presentation sir
So any query or question, please. If there are some query. Uh, Mr. Atik has a question. Mr. Sami, please unmute uh, Atik, sir. Okay, 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 please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Atik Bulchi from Japan. <laughs> So okay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yes, sir. So it's a great presentation. And uh, my question is that, I mean, uh, when we are exchanging emails regarding this issue, also I had this question, but uh, the question is that how, what are the strategies uh, you are thinking uh, to get data from different countries and uh, unify those uh, and then uh, work on it? So would you please give a bit uh, more on this point. Thank you. Right, this is a big challenge how we can address that. So for instance, um, uh, the idea is can we bring experienced uh, healthcare professionals on board? Right, so that's one particular way. Uh, and if they are coming on board to give a uh, workshop, then probably our inexperience or lack of experience <clears throat> colleagues or health professionals can can learn from from the experienced people so that's one particular way to uh, to address a segment of the whole problem the other uh, option uh, country like uk uh, they have uh, very high quality data and uh, it is uh, very little chance to mislead the data at here so relatively much more precise data so we have access national health service data recorded here but anonymous data so we, we cannot see who who is the patient but we have access uh, to the to the patient data that uh, this is what uh, the nhs national health service has so we thought to uh, bring that on board uh, to to understand the challenges and then we also have nhs uh, hospital uh, on board in the team uh, in, in UK team. And we have hospital from Italy, hospital from India, hospital from Pakistan. Uh, in every single country involved, actually, we have hospital. And in Bangladesh, we invited Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib University as a lead university. So they are actually leading from hospital side. And uh, uh, for our project is knowledge sharing model more focused towards how the challenges were addressed. So we are not analyzing uh, big data as you traditionally you do for other analyses, but we are bringing more experience focused data to address the challenges. Uh, and if we, when we develop the model, the pilot testing will be in different low income countries to see whether it works. So if we develop a model in India, for example, that model will be tested in Africa, like Ethiopia or Cambodia, sorry, Uganda, to understand whether it is uh, something uh, applicable to those countries as well. And the model developed in India will be in collaboration with uh, AI, uh, ICT or digital technology, as well as the uh, hospital or health domain. And the model valid will be validated to another country like uh, in Africa or Brazil. That will be also by health professionals that whether it is something uh, applicable to those countries or adapted to those countries. So it's a, it's a reusable adaptive model so that uh, it can be adapted in a number of low income countries. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We cannot give a, a clear uh, picture of, okay, these are the data set we are using for that purpose because there are a wide range of application. Uh, exactly. for, example, for example, one application is, uh, let's say, care, personalized care model development. One application is integrated tracking, tracing, and monitoring. Uh, usually tracking, tracing are not integrated with health uh, uh, changes or health. Uh, issues moni uh, monitoring at the same time. So there are various challenges, various type of data. Hope it gives some impression how we want to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, with us. And hope in coming days, sir, you will be with IEEE uh, Computer Society Bangladesh chapter. Thank you, sir. 
Welcome. Thank you all the rest to everyone. Take care. If you have any uh, uh, question, feel free to send me an email. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take Thank care. You, Thank you, sir. So, we are So we are almost at the end of our actually this program and we have our last speaker and it is Professor Dr. Mohammad Abdul Rajak. He is also the chair of IT Poly Bangladesh, uh, Computer Society Bangladesh chapter. Dr. Mohammad Abdul Rajak is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. He is now working for Green University of Bangladesh as the Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Currently, he is serving as the chairperson of IG Poly Computer Society Bangladesh chapter. Professor Rajak completed his BSc in Applied Physics and Electronics and MSc in Computer Science from the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh in 1997 and 1999, respectively. He obtained his PhD in computer engineering from Kyunghee University, South Korea. He was a research professor, College of Electronics and Information, Kyunghee University during 2010-2011. He worked as a visiting professor at Stratford University, Virginia, USA in 2017. He was the principal investigator of some national and international research projects funded by the Government of Bangladesh and Information Society Innovation Fund, Asia. Additionally, he was the vice chairperson of IT Poly Computer Society Bangladesh chapter in 2018 and 2019. His research interest is in the area of, of modeling analysis and optimization of wireless networking protocols and architectures, wireless sensor and body area networks, sensor data clouds, internet of things, cognitive radio networks. He has published more than 130 research papers in international conferences and journals. He is an associate editor of IEEE Access, additional editor, member of Journal of Networks and Applications, Elsevier and International Journal of Distributed Sensor Networks, General Chair of STI 2020, then TPC Chair of ICIT 2019-2018, TPC Member of IEEE, HPCC, ICYN, then Schema, ICIV, and many other conferences. He is a senior member of IEEE, member of IEEE Communication Society, IT Poly Computer Society, Internet Society, Pacific Telecommunications Council, and KIPS. I request Professor Rajak, please kindly start your talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Shamsil Arefin, for your kind words. Uh, I was listening uh, to the three speakers, uh, they are the distinguished persons in the respective fields, especially I should utter the name of Professor Dr. Muhammad Alongir Hussain, my guru, and after his speech it's really difficult to share something with him, but uh, rather than focusing uh, the key areas uh, related to uh, data analysis, uh, I would rather in today's talk uh, would uh, focus on uh, how to control the further spread of COVID-19 using sensing, computing, and communication technologies. Well, my talk would be uh, rather lightweight. I will focus on many areas, but not dig into a particular uh, engineering or computing methodology. 
Well, these are the areas I would first talk on some introductory and problem statement, then talk on physical sensing, social sensing, and human cyber physical sensing systems. How can we uh, integrate the capacity and the capability of these sensing areas to control COVID-19 uh, spread? Uh, that will be the focusing point of my today's uh, discussion. Well, I quickly overview, I, you already know what COVID-19 is and uh, from where it has been is spread. It. You, you know, possibly if it is the bats from where it has been uh, spread. And we all know that it is the droplets generated from an infected person is repeatedly causing others to be infected, especially from coughing, sneezing and exhaling. And more interestingly, a single sneeze of a person may contain up to 100,000 droplets. And those droplets are moving at 100 miles per hour. So dangerous. And such a dangerous uh, masses have panicked us all across the whole world. And we are experiencing lockdown. The busy roads are vacant now and the highly crowdy areas live areas has now been declared as inaccessible so really it's a uh, uh, depressing situation the society is expressing uh, experiencing and definitely uh, we have also experienced seeing the mass deaths in different uh, corners of the world uh, similarly, uh, that we experienced during the uh, war situation in a country or world war situation across the globe. And not only that, even some of the uh, management of authority of graveyards are also declaring not to receive any dead body caused or death occurred due to uh, COVID-19. So this is uh, the heinous uh, state uh, of the society and definitely it is increasing the social unrest. And unfortunately, there is no specific treatment so far, uh, even though uh, the medical specialists, the virologists, uh, genetic engineers, microbiologists are continuously working uh, to find out something, but till today, we don't know what is a specific medicine, what is a specific vaccine for this. And we are only depending on some uh, 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 healthcare, uh, uh, primary healthcare issues related to uh, this. Even uh, no uh, border guards are capable to protect uh, the traveling from one country to another, one continent to another of this virus in a tremendous uh, state. Well, my today's talk will basically uh, focus on answering some uh, research questions. How can we increase the localization accuracy of the infected areas? And that can be communicated in real time with the nearby community. Uh, and definitely how to monitor the remote healthcare patients and that can be done remotely so that the uh, healthcare officers, doctors, nurses uh, uh, can be kept at less risk uh, for, for, for giving the treatment for the affected patients. And uh, related to some uh, geographic and demographic distribution of infection can be uh, more accurately be uh, measured uh, with the use of recent sensing, computing, and communication uh, technologies. Well, uh, uh, before going to uh, the model we are uh, trying to develop, uh, let us introduce before you uh, some of the physical sensors and the concept of social sensing and the human cyber physical sensing uh, that will be utilized in the model that will be presented uh, at the later part of this uh, presentation. Well, as you already know that uh, our, uh, our textile shirts and the words can be electronic ones that are capable to 
read your heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, body temperature, etc., and can communicate through a coordinator, uh, through, through through a coordinator to your smartphone, even to a particular remote uh, cloud computing server from where data can be processed and can can be used or communicated. Even uh, uh, your moving speed, uh, lung function, pneumonia, blood oxygen level, uh, etc., can be uh, measured by using e textile shards. There are a series of on body sensors to know uh, that uh, we can analyze the sweat of a human body to understand the sodium, potassium ions, and lactate and glucose ions and their, uh, and their levels, etc. Similarly, uh, uh, blood pressure, blood glucose, etc., using some on body sensors. Even you can swallow uh, a digital sensor device as a pill. We are calling it digital pills. And these pills, you see, has within, uh, uh, within the belly of that particular pill, there is a very tiny electronic circuit. It's an IoT device, uh, hardly uh, with the dimension two millimeter by two millimeter. And uh, there are capsules with the camera sensors that can be swallowed. And more interestingly, uh, this type of capsules or the tablets can monitor the different functionalities, how it is reacting with the other ingredients over there. Even this type of uh, capsules can take the snapshots, pixels, and can send to the coordinator device and then to the server or to the mobile phone application that you do have. So these are the physical sensors that are being highly used. These are not in the research laboratory, this is in the commercial level, are being highly used to take care of uh, uh, many uh, physiological problems uh, of the patients. And uh, coming towards uh, uh, the virus-related uh, problems, our today's problem is related to coronavirus. Uh, well, definitely there is no such sensor for the coronavirus to detect, but very similar one, another one is dengue virus, you know, in this case also non-structural protein is being developed in the infected areas. And the electrical behavior of the uh, non-structural protein NS1 uh, has been measured uh, by Professor Dr. Paolo Rosa recently uh, in the University of Bath Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering uh, uh, to, to identify whether a particular patient is uh, uh, having uh, uh, with the dengue uh, virus or not. Well, till now, for the no COVID-19, we do not know any sensor device, but I do strongly believe that uh, uh, once uh, the uh, micro-level characteristics uh, will be clearly known to the microbiologists, to the virologists, to the genetic engineers, a sensor similar to that one will also be available for detecting the uh, coronavirus. Till now, we are depending on the NT-PCR and the antibody test, as you, many of the previous speakers have already mentioned. So there is no physical sensors up there. So we need to develop on some, some other sensing capacity, sensing systems. One of the recently uh, perceived concept is social sensing. Uh, before introducing social senses, sensing, uh, let me uh, introduce you with the pit pitfalls of the physical sensors. You know, the physical sensors can get the reading of uh, many physical events, but still there are some specific actions, especially related to uh, some suspicious individuals or crime scenes, the physical sensors cannot be uh, uh, used to identify those. For example, recently you have noticed that this person, Mr. Majid, Bangabandhu murderer, were arrested from Gaktul area at midnight. And he was in a rickshaw moving in a suspicious state and is being uh, monitored by police officers. And after some of the questions, he was. Uh, 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 being caught uh, 
uh, and, and he declared himself later. So think about, can we detect some suspicious movements of a person uh, with the physical sensors? Uh, definitely it would be very much difficult. So human sensor can be utilized over there. Similarly, uh, you'll see if there is a violence uh, uh, occurred in some place. Well, while the physical sensors uh, can be used to identify whether a particular violence has been occurred or not, but it, it would be really very difficult to find out the answers of other questions using physical sensors like, who are the parties involved in that particular violence? And who started first? And what causes the violence? That those questions may be unanswered if we deploy physical sensors over there. So we have to depend on some other kind of sensing phenomena. Uh, I, in, in this connection, I would like to mention two events. In 2013, Boston Marathon was going on. When it is at the end, hundreds of people are at the end of the marathon last mile, then series of bombings uh, occurred over there. And more interestingly, Sasa News, before coming to the uh, 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 the uh, uh, broadcasting media, any TV or radio broadcasting media, that uh, that message appears in Twitter several minutes before. Similarly, in 2010 in Haiti, when cholera outbreak was experienced, uh, somewhat around 8,000, more than 8,000 people died, and 665 thousand people were infected that news appears in CRN only two weeks after it appeared in social media so seven years or ten years before from now you observe that how fast the social media was uh, at that time and right at the moment you know uh, almost 60-70% people of the world are using uh, social media uh, uh, always. And that has democratized the source of information. It's not only the source of authentic information is from the national news channel or the uh, uh, printed uh, papers, rather from the individual persons. Someone may perceive from a discussion that the social sensing is meaning that some of my friend in social uh, media is posting about an event and when I log on to the social media, I come to know what are the happenings over there. No, that is not what social sensing is. Social sensing is one step ahead. Irrespective of that, whether you do have an account in a social media or not, if you have some interest, on a particular surface, then uh, uh, you, 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 are, you have registered into a server system to get a particular service, and irrespective of your registration with any social media, if related to that particular surface, something occurred in the society, you will be notified. You will be notified. For example, uh, one uh, proctor of a university, Bangladesh University, he wants to know uh, any event, if it is occurred in any uh, areas of the uh, campus, immediately he wants to know it, whether the message appears to him through the official channel or not, he wants to be informed. Uh, a Polish uh, superintendent SP of a particular district wants to know uh, the right immediate information uh, uh, right at the moment. Uh, then uh, through the social media posting, if he registers, then he will be allowed to get that particular information. So from the social media posting, from the physical uh, sensing, data will be gathered in a particular server system, will be processed through some uh, big data analytics, machine learning, uh, AI techniques, and then the outcome that the knowledge that Professor Alumgir was talking about, the outcome knowledge will be provided towards the uh, group of people who are receiving the information. The, 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 the methodology is in broad sense known as 
crowd sensing, crowd sourcing. Based on this concept, recently we do have uh, a very good publication in IEEE uh, Journal of Internet of Things. Well, relating to that, uh, we want to uh, make some uh, changes and need some additional ingredients uh, to address the challenges related to the uh, COVID-19. And this kind of social sensing has already been uh, established as uh, uh, a, a proven technology uh, for real-time monitoring of crowd of a specific event uh, poverty prediction in developing countries and many other areas. So, uh, before going to the uh, proposed model, let me talk about, let uh, focus on the human cyber physical system. Why, how intervention of human in the cyber physical systems can further help us to identify uh, uh, some of the specific problems and uh, model the solutions accordingly. Well, the human himself or herself can be used as a sensor, rather than using the physical sensor or using the social media posting as a source of information, uh, a, a person himself or herself can also be utilized as a, uh, a sensor. You know that the God has gifted us very powerful uh, sensing components uh, of, for us. If a violence like this is occurred, a human can correctly identify uh, who is the initiator, who are the parties involved, and uh, what causes a particular uh, event like this. I believe you remember this picture. It's the Rana Plaza event in Shabhar. Fall, a sudden fall of a government's uh, building, eight story government's building. And you also remember. Uh, the name of this 18 year old lady, uh, Reshma. Uh, fortunately, he was found live, rescued live after only 16 days of that particular event. Think about if a particular human sensing device or something, uh, uh, the technology was available with her, then, then, then the society uh, uh, did not need to wait for 16 days to recover or maybe only 16 hours or even 16 minutes uh, may be sufficient to identify a person is available at the ground floor in the uh, in the in the in the uh, mosque uh, place or the prayer room of that particular uh, building so uh, uh, that could be uh, uh, worked as a uh, a human sensor, I will talk about uh, the model that, that I'm going to uh, present in the next slide. Well, this model is based on two basic observations. The first observation is people around the globe are sharing their health state and the experiences related to COVID-19 in online social media. The last week's experience is 18 million plus people are sharing their experiences, uh, their own experiences, their family members' experiences, their neighbors' experiences, friends' experiences uh, in, in, in social media. So it's, it's, it's a large body of source of information that can be analyzed. Another one is the official warning channels through TV uh, or, 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 or printed media, uh, radio, those are relatively much lower uh, uh, compared to the uh, uh, social media. And even if we use human as a sensor and use some, some physical sensor over there, you will see in the next slide that we'll be able to make it almost real time. And definitely uh, a wrist band like this uh, is, is quite helpful to uh, monitor the patient. We can track his uh, GPS, we can track his body status, temperature, blood pressure, and many other things. Even we can use geofencing. Uh, uh, the, the hospital authority or the doctor can compel a particular patient to locate within a particular building, within a particular area. If he or she violates uh, the recommendation of the doctor, 
uh, he or she may be uh, under, 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 under some administration using this geofencing that can be done over there. Some biometric sensors can also be associated to monitor that particular patient. Even patient himself or herself can give some status input. I'll show you in the next slide some feedback towards the doctor. And a single doctor, rather than monitoring or checking the patient in person in hospital, sitting in his or her desk, she can monitor real time some 50, 100 patients uh, remotely. So such a system uh, uh, can help us a lot. Uh, I would like to, there are many parties involved over there. Uh, I would like to uh, discuss this model with uh, uh, an example. Let's say someone is living in uh, Dhaka city, Dhanmundi area, and he or she is feeling uh, the COVID-19 symptoms and uh, he submitted his uh, sample to Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Medical University at Shahabad. And after one day when he uh, uh, visit again uh, uh, the hospital, he unfortunately is identified uh, by the COVID-19. As soon as he or she is identified, consider that a brand is word in his or her hand and his mobile application uh, a, a mobile application is being installed in uh, his or her mobile and he is recommended to stay at home and maintain some health safety security and so on at minimum level think about when he uh, using his mobile application uh, sets that his destination is Dhanmundi road number 8, house number something, etc. Then when he is heading from the Shahabak to that area, that let's say that, that the data is available in the central server and after being processed, the people living in that road or nearby area will be notified automatically from this central server that uh, within some 20 minutes a COVID patient is coming. As Professor Alamgir Sar was talking about, well, definitely the identification of that person is not the point of concern here. Uh, privacy issues is over there. But at least the, uh, the, the central place or, 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 the, or, or the center of the uh, place where he or she is going to uh, stay can be shared with others so that, so that within some 500 meter, who are the other people using that particular service from the central system can be uh, uh, given the information. Even related to that, not only the mobile phone application and uh, the other sensors, some Bluetooth uh, devices uh, can also be utilized uh, when uh, someone is uh, coming uh, in, in contact or close contact with some other person, he or she may be notified or alerted uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, before. And similar, similarly, the medical doctors, the clinical research and the physicians will define the protocols, will analyze the different patient symptoms, etc. and will guide uh, the computer science and engineering ex uh, technology experts to develop uh, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data uh, techniques to develop the knowledge and, 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 and serve the patients, uh, the people who are uh, being connected uh, to get the services from this server. And definitely that patient uh, we have put into different, two different areas in the first area. Well, uh, consider that patient is in the house here and he sometimes may give some input using mobile application that uh, about his test, uh, fatigueness pain status, diet. Well, you see that uh, whether uh, uh, he is getting test or not, or whether he is getting uh, or, or the feeling for the feeling hungry or not, or feeling some pain or fatigue, uh, this type of uh, uh, physiological conditions are really very difficult to identify with the physical sensor. So human as a sensor can use the mobile application to give input to the central server so that he or she can get appropriate uh, 
uh, medical uh, uh, supports from the uh, experts. And again, if the situation is uh, for that particular patient, we can think about that patient to wear some uh, sensor, biometric sensors, body temperature, even sensors are available to identify, to detect or whether a person is coughing or sneezing, blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, and activity monitoring. Activity monitoring using the camera sensors can also be deployed in the room. We are calling it home health hub. In the room where the patient is living, can be monitored using camera monitors to identify his or her movement and whether really he is being quarantined and keeping physical distance properly from the other family members over there and wearing masks or not and many other things can be uh, monitored his activity etc can be uh, monitored definitely appropriate policies health management policies from the health sector of the government need to be given input to the central systems so that uh, uh, the appropriate uh, privacy levels and the security levels can be maintained and the uh, laws can be implemented into the systems to protect the rights of the individual person as well as the uh, patients and similarly not only that the people who are not using the mobile applications in the nearby areas of that particular patient in road number eight Thanmundi area if some five person understand about that then those person may again post into the social media uh, that can be another source of information for the uh, central repository system and for the uh, others and gradually it may be the information may be spread to the uh, others and definitely uh, some in infrastructure management systems need to be uh, developed as well so but a such a system even though there are hundreds of questions uh, uh, how truly the data can be collected how reliably uh, the system can uh, uh, analyze the data and uh, what are the different types of sources of data etc uh, uh, but 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 good thing is that uh, many people across the world are uh, addressing uh, to collect uh, the data from the social sources, uh, from the unreliable data in, in the social sources to, to convert into a reliable one uh, uh, and, and use it as a knowledgeful information for the others. In addition to that, think about this is a uh, Uber snapshot, like Uber application, when we run, uh, we can see who are the persons, uh, uh, who are the cars, what are the cars available in my nearby area. Similarly, uh, when I will uh, uh, turn on my mobile application, uh, if I would be able to see what are the people uh, with COVID-19 positive are around me, then I can control my movement accordingly. So this is, uh, uh, one of the features of the application that can be developed to give real-time information to the uh, nearby people and uh, as a user we can also get information to uh, protect ourselves accordingly. Well there are hundreds of challenges this is my last slide. The very first challenge is data collection as you know the social media is a noisy place of data. Uh, there may be ethnic belief, biasness, misinterpretation, of human sensor and uh, the good news is that uh, there are uh, uh, groups of people around the uh, globe are working i know one people professor uh, tarek abdul jahir from university of uh, illinois at urbana champaign he is working uh, 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 for collecting uh, reliable data from the noisy source of uh, social media and many other people are working on that and the initial algorithms are there but definitely concentrating on the COVID-19 problem, our young researchers can explore the literature study related to uh, collecting uh, reliable data from the noisy sources of uh, social media data related to uh, this one. And definitely uh, some truth discovery algorithms to increase the reliability of the data. 
uh, uh, some probabilistic algorithms are also available uh, in the literature and our young researchers can, can study those and think about how to deploy some deep machine learning techniques by iterative learning methods to increase the reliability of the uh, uh, data sources. Well, another important point is uh, uh, the, the, the text data is really unfiltered. Someone is writing Bengali words, but using English letters. Someone may use uh, emails, audio, video, and many different types of emojis as, as well. So uh, uh, the diverse kind of source of data uh, uh, to, to model in a single uniform uh, understanding uh, uh, method is, is really a challenging problem. Someone having interest to data modeling uh, can also uh, concentrate over there. And related to many other problems, uh, uh, I'm out of time. I would just uh, uh, put one uh, more important is human factor challenge. In Bangladesh, you see now uh, when a particular uh, uh, evidence, uh, 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 a, a particular occurrence uh, is observed in the road, uh, uh, two uh, different people believing in two different uh, 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 political wings may you know, provide totally different data uh, for a single event. Uh, uh, someone believing uh, in current uh, government politics may uh, explain a particular event that this is an event where uh, some people were making noise in the uh, road and the police uh, bravely uh, appeared on time and uh, 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 saved the life, something like that. And someone believing in opposite uh, political belief may explain like uh, uh, some hungry workers were demonstrating over there uh, against uh, uh, their, their, their owner of the factory. Uh, and, uh, and and the uh, police have, uh, has shown the brutality over there. So totally uh, different uh, masses may come over there. So this type of human factor is another challenge to collect information from the uh, social sources uh, to make best use of the social sensing. And again, good news is that uh, there are some uh, uh, very good level of works related to collecting uh, COVID-19 related uh, uh, data uh, to make it uh, reliable and uh, trustworthy. Uh, but even I believe uh, this is not, uh, this is immature level uh, till now. And uh, if, if you have some interest, you can uh, concentrate over there as well. And definitely as the social sensing is giving us the facility to spread information rapidly at the same time, like pandemic, Information infodemic is a term I believe you uh, have already you are already introduced to this term. Uh, this is a serious issue uh, now, uh, 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 and, and you can you can think about how to address uh, such infodemic type of problems uh, related to uh, social media posting and communicating a message uh, with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people. So thank you very much for your patience uh, in hearing. Uh, this is all about my side. And uh, this talk was uh, not in depth on a particular model or particular system rather than on diverse system focusing on how to control the spread of COVID-19, uh, especially using the sensing, computing, and communication technologies of computer science and engineering. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Rajak, uh, for your nice uh, presentation, uh, really correlating different fields and different dimensions uh, to fight against COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, now I would like to uh, uh, conclude, we are at the uh, conclusion of our four sessions. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Dr. M. Shamim Kaisar uh, to take uh, some of these initiatives from IEEE Computer Society Workshop and Conference Committee. Uh, and with uh, uh, Professor Dr. Shamsul Arifin, today's moderator. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Muhammad Samin Rahman uh, in our HEC committee lead. 
and also this program is organized by IT Puli Computer Society with the support of the Spark team. And I would like to mention some names from the Spark team, Mr. Uh, Arjo and Oyon, they did a lot to organize this event. And design team led by Faisal, content writing team led by Alvi, and publication, publicity and social media branding led by Aminu. Uh, they actually uh, did the background work for organizing this event. I would like to request uh, uh, thanking from our uh, Computer Society XCOM and our, uh, our workshop and conference committee to all of them. We would also like to thank our uh, six student branch chapters, uh, AIUB, Bragg University, Buet, Jahangir University, Ruet, and ULAB uh, to support this, uh, this event. And uh, uh, Professor Abdul Rajak, sir, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, we are really very grateful to our chair of IT Puli Computer Society Bangladesh chapter uh, to uh, deliver a technical session in this uh, in this technical session of our 12 talks. We have successfully completed these talks and uh, I would like to hand over to Professor Dr. Abdul Rajak to answer some questions uh, from uh, participants if, if they have any and uh, some concluding remarks regarding this event uh, of our fourth season. Uh, Thank you from excuse my Excuse me. Side. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Professor Alamgir is uh, trying to ask some comment. Uh, yes, he yes. has written yes. it. Yes. Sir, Alamgir, sir. Hello. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, absolutely impressive presentation, uh, including the last one. Uh, I really enjoy. Now, what are the challenges we have uh, that we all do brilliant work, but not well organized, not well structured. We don't have a really good uh, framework to say, okay, this is how we can proceed from this point. IEEE is doing brilliant job, but can we also think of having some uh, or creating some opportunity like working together in a serious uh, scenario like this uh, under a framework or under a particular uh, charitable organization or a crowdfunding source or uh, if there is any let's say rich people for example want to build up something for that particular reason then we can contribute together so uh, think about that because uh, the, the works are there, but these are not uh, well organized or not well integrated. So something you are doing, I, I didn't know that you are working to this particular domain. Otherwise, I could have invited you uh, the global uh, challenge related funding application. And uh, that may give some opportunity to work together. Uh, but there are all it, uh, less opportunity uh, coming every now and then. So if we have a good platform, for example, uh, I propose digital clinic, for instance, that uh, it is not only for COVID-19, there might be many other similar scenario or even COVID-19 may continue this year or uh, future. Uh, there are prediction that second wave or consecutive wave could be there. So think about how we can make it more organized in terms of contributing to each other, knowing each other, and bringing funding to work together to make a uh, productive outcome for the region, for the country. Uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to make this comment. Thank you, sir. Definitely, sir, actually guideline can intelligent इन्स्टीट्यूशनल उद्योग जैगाटली बसब सर आप
Yeah, any other you. comment? Any other comment from any other uh, uh, participant? Uh, if not, then uh, Dr. Samim, you may uh, say a few words, concluding words. I'm requesting you to say some concluding <laughs> concluding word for us because you are the chair. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to say something, right? No, no. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, dear participants, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, uh, it was a great honor for us, the IEEE Computer Society uh, Bangladesh chapter, uh, to have uh, you uh, amongst us uh, uh, during this international uh, lecture series. And uh, it has been success only because of your uh, enthusiastic live participation and uh, the keen interest and the love you have demonstrated for knowing uh, the state of the art technologies uh, to address the challenges that we are facing. Well, definitely, if you look uh, at the problem, it's COVID-19. Uh, it's health related problem someone can readily make a comment that it's the problem related to doctors it's a problem related to uh, uh, pharmacists it's a problem related to genetic engineers or biotechnologists or virologists or microbiologists but if you look into the problem further in depth you see that uh, there are many things from uh, uh, many things to do from uh, our point of view, uh, from the technical point of view, specifically uh, with the technologies related to electronics, uh, medical uh, uh, electronics speci specifically, and then the power of mobile applications, mobile technologies, the power of artificial intelligence, big data analysis, machine uh, learning. Uh, these uh, these discussions have proven that we have a lot of areas to concentrate onto the problem and uh, contribute to the society uh, from the areas of expertise that we do have. So I uh, expect that uh, this has this discussion has not only opened up a good number of research avenues for all of you, the young scientists and the researchers, engineers, and the practitioners, but also uh, it has facilitated uh, a great network communication amongst us. So you are being introduced with many of the reported speakers. You are being introduced with many of the reported uh, uh, faculty members, researchers uh, in the respective areas of the country. So uh, cooperation, co collaboration uh, at the further level might help us to develop a sustainable solution in future days. So I, I ask you all uh, to look into the uh, problems from your own eye point of view and invite others who can uh, uh, be of help in any aspect to contribute or to shake hands with you uh, uh, to develop uh, a system. And you know uh, from Bangladesh uh, in the digital uh, repository, uh, be it IEEE, SCM digital repository or uh, any other digital repository, significant contributions uh, are now being made in every year. And we believe that uh, this will exponentially increase in the future years with your contributions and definitely in many of the universities right at the moment uh, the physical uh, classes are off uh, but our learning process um, our knowledge uh, exercise process cannot be stopped it must be continued whatever the state we do have the IEEE has already uh, facilitated uh, to download free of cost all the research papers related to uh, COVID-19. If some one ten percent, five percent is related to COVID-19, the content of the paper, then it can be downloaded freely. So sitting at home, 
having a computer in your room, room or house, you can you can do some research. It's not only that. Uh, when the university will open, I will be able to meet with my friends and sit in the laboratory. Then I will do the research. It's, it's, it's not like that. There are many research problems that you can solve sitting at your house and communicating with your uh, friends, teachers, your mentors, your supervisors. So uh, I, I strongly believe that this is a high time to concentrate, concentrate uh, onto the research problems and uh, uh, devise some solutions to solve the practical problems of our society, as well as focusing on uh, contributing to the uh, uh, digital uh, repository. And definitely that will uh, 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 increase your personal, professional skills as well. So thank you very much again. And I do wholeheartedly appreciate the efforts made by every person of IEEE Computer Society Bangladesh sector, especially the uh, uh, keen uh, uh, activities, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, restless activities done by the executive members, uh, especially the uh, conference coordinator of IEEE Computer Society Bangladesh sector, Dr. Shamim Kaisar, you do really you have really performed a fantastic job, exemplary one, and I believe many of us uh, have good things to learn from this uh, event. And I believe IEEE Computer Society uh, will continue uh, to assemble uh, scholars from industry, from uh, academia, uh, from home and abroad in future days also. Uh, to discuss on the content, contemporary issues in future days uh, and make our uh, young community you know, well informed about the technical challenges uh, or, or, or the problems uh, uh, to be solved in the future days and give a good direction uh, to them. So thank you very much again, uh, uh, all the participants, all the well-wishers, all the volunteers, uh, uh, the executive committee members uh, and I personally uh, uh, say sorry that uh, I, I could not make myself available in all the presentations during the uh, 12 keynote speakers due to uh, uh, my extremely busy hours in professional uh, involvement in the last two weeks. So thank you very much again and uh, uh, that's all from my, uh, my side. Thank you, Professor Dr. Abdurajak, uh, for uh, your concluding remarks. Uh, I would like to again thank our SPARC team and all other volunteers who have uh, under the background work, technical work, publicity work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can uh, close the meeting now.